In a dawn attack on September 1st, 1939, German forces crossed into Poland. From the beginning, civilians were among those targeted for destruction. It was clear the nature of this conflict would surpass in cruelty anything in the grim history of war. Hitler stated his goals clearly. The aim is not the arrival at a certain line, but the annihilation of living forces. Kill Poles without mercy, all men, women and children of Polish descent or language. Only in this way can we obtain the living space we need. All Poles will disappear from the world. It is essential that the great German people should consider it as its major task to destroy all Poles. Fighting alone against the greatest military power of the time, Poland was suddenly attacked by the Soviet Union on the east. Against these two mighty dictatorships, the Poles were forced to capitulate on October 5, 1939. Hitler and Stalin divided the prostrate country between them, and everything we know as human rights was suspended for the people of Poland. In the German-occupied zone, this meant mass arrests, deportations to concentration camps, slavery, and mass executions. Notices listing names of the executed and threats of reprisal for resistance were widely posted. The German occupying forces began segregating the Jewish from the Christian population, ultimately setting up walled-in ghettos where Jews were forced to live in appalling misery. Proclamations of a death sentence for Jews found outside ghetto walls and for Polish Christians offering any form of assistance were posted throughout the so-called Aryan areas. Not only individuals, but entire Christian families and sometimes neighbors were summarily executed for helping Jews. Their names were publicized to deter others. In the ghettos, Death through starvation, disease, and random murder became common. Then, in 1942, the Germans implemented a frightening new policy. The wholesale deportation of Jews and their extermination in gas chambers. These were the conditions under which Zhegota was born. It was in the summer of 1942 when the first horrible massive liquidations of the Warsaw Ghetto began. Władysław Bartoszewski, historian, former foreign minister of Poland, and co-founder in 1942 of Zhegota. Over 300,000 people were eventually taken out by the Germans to an unknown destination, which we later learned was the Treblinka death camp. Some people at that time particularly those who were already involved in helping their Jewish friends, realized that their help was insufficient and that an organized procedure had to be developed. The idea for this effort came from two women, Sofia Kosak, a conservative Catholic writer, and Wanda Krahelska Filipowicz, a socialist activist. Together with others in the Polish underground and with the support of the Polish government in exile in London, they formed a clandestine organization to aid Jews, Zhegota. The name Zhegota is actually code word for the Council for Jewish Help. At that time, it was very often used to indicate any helping activity. I came into contact with several people older than myself, such as Jan Karski and others, who I met through Zofia Kosak in the fall of 1942. These were people who were older than I. Because of my horrible experiences when I myself was a prisoner in Auschwitz, it seemed proper to me to lend my assistance. In October 1942, the official paper of the Polish underground announced the formation of the Council for Aid to Jews. Dragota, I know exactly how it began because at that time, we were in contact with the leaders of the Home Army. Dr. Marek Edelman, 
eminent surgeon among the last surviving members of the Jewish ghetto fighting force still living in Poland. The first actual contact I had with Zhergota agents was in the Warsaw Ghetto in January 1943. This occurred after the arrival of the first money sent from America. The Home Army who organized this group, which was the Relief Committee for Jews, who were hiding on the Aryan side. Among the hiding places on the Aryan side for members of the Jewish underground was this Carmelite convent where the nuns also stored arms for the underground soldiers. Mrs. Mariana Hochberg, Zhegota participant in her early 20s in Krakow, now Miriam Peleg, living in Israel. How did I find myself associated with Zhegota? One of my co-workers, also a young pre-war socialist, told me one day that in Warsaw, an organization was being formed to help Jews. They needed, in addition to Polish activists, at least one representative of the Jewish community to be included in their group. I then met Mr. Dobrovolsky, who was the chairman of this council in Krakow, who told me about the operations of this new organization. Ms. Teresa Prekarova, now a historian and herself recognized for her rescue work during the occupation. Jogota had as its goals social welfare and charitable activities, not military. It was to take care of civilians. Its primary concern was to obtain and distribute money to Jewish people in need. In general, the people escaping from the ghetto were without money, and their survival depended greatly on their receiving monetary help. The delegate's office in Warsaw received these funds from the London-based Polish government in exile, through parachutists, the same way that all other Polish underground organizations received their support. Here in Warsaw, a network was formed which distributed this money. These are receipts which were signed by Jewish people who confirmed that they received financial help. They were controlled by two Zhagota vice chairmen who checked and signed each page and verified their accuracy. This is how they confirmed payments. These signatures here are those of the representatives of the Bund and Zionist party. I walked out of the Warsaw Ghetto one day in February 43. Mrs. Helena Kvyatkowska was in her early 30s when she was imprisoned in the ghetto. My Polish friends were waiting for me. I left unobserved in the middle of a group of Jewish laborers who worked for the Germans on the Aryan side. I had made a secret arrangement with my friends, but unfortunately, shortly after they met me, we were discovered by two blackmailers who obviously wanted money from me. Of course, we did not want to admit to anything, so we continued walking in the direction of my friend's house where I was to stay temporarily, but they would not leave us. We walked to a pharmacy, but they waited outside for us. So finally, my friends had to pay them off with their own money for two or three days. This I don't exactly remember. I lived with friends, after which I was moved to another apartment which had been prepared for me. There, for the first time, I realized that I had come into contact with the Jagota organization. At Jagota's urging, the Polish underground decreed a death sentence on blackmailers and denouncers and published it along with their names in its newspapers and on posters. A second very important issue was that of documents. Even for a regular Polish citizen, it was difficult to create forged documents. Where could you get them? You couldn't buy them in a store. One needed to know where and how to obtain them. And besides, some sources made good false documents, others poor ones, only to sell them and make some profit. The Jagoda organization, however, had access to the best forgers. 
Among them were those of the Home Army, which had to prepare documents for their own intelligence workers who operated throughout Germany, using these documents to carry out various undercover operations. These forged documents had to be very good, and they were. So for Zhergota, there was a high level of paperwork activity involving files, records and documents, aside from monetary help. All of this action was coordinated with the Home Army Legalization Office, which I believe was located on Kapusinska. While most Polish birth certificates were provided by priests, German documents were forged by underground specialists. Zygoda itself manufactured about 50,000 documents and distributed even more because it also distributed documents prepared by other underground organizations. From my own experience and from my meetings with people who were helped and with whom I still have contact today, people who were under my care, I have to say that Zygota might have been their last hope of rescue. They received documents and money, but not only that, more important was the feeling of moral support that they got. The awareness that there existed a group of people who were trying to care for them, that they weren't so alone. Other Zhogota efforts were directed at helping the children placing them in Polish families, where they were brought up as part of the family, or placing them in orphanages, particularly orphanages associated with Catholic monasteries. The convents directed by Sister Superior Matilda Getter were among the most active, sheltering more than 600 Jewish children. Mrs. Irena Sendlerova, who was crippled in her service to Zhegota, the woman who reported me couldn't stand up to the beatings. She gave them my name. So the Germans learned that I belonged to an organization which helped Jews. The Germans beat me, tortured me, broke my feet and legs. And when they finished this, they condemned me to death. While this was happening, my Zhogota colleagues did everything they could to free me. Not only to help me personally, but also because I was the only one with coded information regarding 2,500 Jewish children who had been brought by Zhogota to various hiding places, in monasteries, as well as in private homes. And this file of information was hidden in my home. Thanks to fortunate circumstances, it never got into Nazi hands. My foster mother was a Zygota agent who worked with Mrs. Senlerova. Mrs. Elzbieta Fitzowska recalls her experiences as a former hidden child. It was not planned at first that she would become my mother. She was a woman who was a midwife by profession. She worked out of her home on the east side of Warsaw. Thanks to the fact that this home was her property, she could issue birth certificates there, as well as forge papers and register people. I was brought to her when I was five months old. I was driven out of the ghetto in the back of a truck, inside a pile of bricks where I was concealed in a small wooden box with air holes. In that box, as a sleeping infant, I was driven to the Aryan side. I was taken to the home of this midwife, my mother-to-be, as it turned out, who at that time had prepared a safe home for me with a poor servant woman who lived on the outskirts of Warsaw. My mother took exceptional care of these matters. She discovered that the woman had tuberculosis. She then insisted that I not be turned over to her. After thinking about the situation, and the fact that she herself was a widow and that her own children were adults and on their own, she decided that she would be the one to take care of me. 